Is this the death of Dr. David T? Will he go forth and multiply? Hee <laughs> hee! It's who the tram? Trans. Trans and non-binary. Who the trans? 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 Hey, hello, 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 everybody! Welcome. Hello, hello, everybody! Welcome to Who the Trans? Who the trans? Yes, Who the trans? And today we're having a bit of a giggle, or having a go at the giggle. <laughs> Oh, that was more sinister than I intended. Can you give okay. us a giggle like that in an, arpe- an arpeggio? <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful one. I hope you're all joining in at home, friends and folks. Everyone, giggle in together. Uh, we've been enjoying the hell of a mo- ever episode, movie, TV show thing that was The Giggle with Neil Patrick Harris acting the shit out of the toy maker. But before that, better say how we are. So how are you today? Day. I'm doing okay. I'm quite. I'm Ben. Hello. Yes. Hello. I interrupted just before you introduced me. Ben. They. Them. She. Her. Surprise me. I'll take whatever I want. No, I'll take whatever you give. That's the way it works. I'm doing all right, but quite sleepy. I've been doing lots of napping because probably seasonal affective disorder or uh, eating too much breakfast. Either of these things. But apart from this, I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. You can never really have too much breakfast anyway. I always eat. I, I don't really eat breakfast anyway. I'm a bit weird like that. Though people call it into intermittent fasting so i always say that to sound more uh well an excuse rather than just sounding like i don't have enough time between getting up in the morning and going to the office but aside from that i'm doing all right i've just come back from home had a nice lift from my mum from the station that was uh nice all right trying to jam a bike into a car is never a fun exercise it's funner uh, than doing the opposite oh exactly i could be cycling in the rain that is true especially with the uh weather out there today <laughs> oh i was thinking jamming a car into a bike which would be much worse yeah i mean there's plenty of space on the on the panniers for the uh, car you know it depends on whether you've got a smart car or one of those big pickups from america i suppose i haven't either i do have a bike i think but i haven't touched it in a very long time it lives in the garden and gets new shapes and new angles. But I suppose the one uh, vehicle that we all seem to uh, go on about on this uh, series is the TARDIS with the Doctor. Yes! That's my best attempt at a segue there, for if anyone can tell. <laughs> yes! Doctor Who! It's been a very exciting season of Doctor Who, and it does feel like we've had a whole season in some ways, even though it's been three episodes and a bit and a bit. It's It's been a rich... And wonderful month of Doctor Who. And sadly, now it's over. Until a couple of weeks from now, when it's back for Christmas. Oh, exactly. The best part of this was just, like, one, like, having something to look forward to in a weekend. Just to, you know, think, like, oh, if I just get through today, I'm one step, one day closer to Doctor Who (laughs) this weekend. Yes. One day closer to recording with such a lovely podcasting host as such as you are. Or such as Ashley, who you more likely be a a day closer to. Well, I guess if we're doing one of these after every Doctor Who, then... Uh, then indeed, you're, you're too kind. I've been looking forward to this. Especially with so much to talk about. It's just absolutely crazy. Yes, I'm sure we've both come with a lot of notions and flavours. So what's your immediate gut reaction to the giggle? Oh, I am. I have found it bl- really good, like exciting. And some bits was uh, very emotional, fucking scary at some points. I was like, I know Doctor Who's meant to scare the kids, but I was terrified myself. Just put me behind a bloody sofa. I mean, <laughs> it was brilliant and uh, well uh, i was about to talk about a certain character appearing but i'll mm. wait till a bit later on this episode certainly until we have done the donger oh gosh yes the cloister spoiler bell for those who don't know spoilers ahead yes if you're listening to a podcast about the most recent episode of doctor Who without watching the episode you're eccentric to say the least yeah exactly we'll just make sure to put as many klaxons and cloister bells in this episode today so how did you find this episode today i hated it it was crap and it had no sense of character or story is one thing that i saw someone say on a forum but that's not my point of view i enjoyed it <laughs> tremendously i think i'm I, I think I'm just quite good at enjoying Doctor Who. Uh, I I have been in it for the long haul since 1990. I, I coming to the series after it was cancelled, and I've been I've seen the rough with the smooth, and I find ways to enjoy even the the most troublesome Doctor Who. But when it's very enjoyable Doctor Who, uh, I am delighted. And this 
week, like the week of the Star Beast, I could barely sleep after the episode because I was just bouncing around the house. So you had so much like vindication on well, what we'll get into in a second, but and also it was like, yes, that was so brilliant and just hype for everything, isn't it? And also, it was such a good episode. Yes. Perhaps we should have our uh, our Sploister Bell now so we can start getting into the uh, the bits and pieces. The timey wimey blips and blops and but yeah, let's uh, clang that. Yes, before we talk about the big eneration, here comes the bell. <laughs> now we know that one of us is doomed. Yes, but we'll find out next Tuesday or something. I don't know, or uh, the next working out week or something. You know, you never know when. In four to six weeks, your parcel will turn up with your doom in it. You'll find out whether you big enerated or just perished. Cloister bells, ahoy! We start off with the toy maker, and so I feel like we should get straight into this astonishing performance. You saw the toy maker, they... Was it he him pronouns for... I believe so. Well, you saw the toy maker just dancing in the streets of London while everything was on fire. Everyone thought they were right, though I'm not seeing much of a difference these days, but everyone thinks they're right, and they're ambushed by a unit saying come here, Doctor! We need you! The whole thing of everybody being right uh, is kind of terrifying and I really like that the idea is introduced and then after the first ten minutes it really never gets acknowledged again because it has served its purpose. You could do this whole thing as a two-parter with the first half a terrifying i mean you could do this as a torchwood 10 parter if you wanted oh, exactly. with the whole world going mad with being right and one thing i liked about it was i was able to log on to the doctor who forum gallifrey base afterwards because i was curious will will this thing of everyone insisting they're right and and yelling at one another will fandom see this and realize that it is themselves and maybe cool their tits a bit no no indeed <laughs> uh, people are still arguing with such furious intensity that things are either their way or the other way, that it feels like the toy maker is in many ways being vindicated. Well, the day things calm down in that matter, we might as well be Cybermen, though, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so everything was on fire, and then you got this really cool shot of the TARDIS, you know, again, being held, you know, being carried by another helicopter. This time, the Doctor isn't hanging out of it this time, which is a bit of a change. Good, it's a perilous thing to do. And the the unit tower, not to be confused with the Tower of London, which was the previous unit tower, or indeed with Avengers Tower, which is very similar. Oh, exactly. There's tons of people who just compare it to the Stark Tower, which is like... Let them. Yeah, let them. We'll say for ours Stark is more great. superior because we've got a great honking laser on it. I'm sure uh, Tony Iron Man has some honking lasers. All lasers can honk if you rub them on a goose. <laughs> I, I don't think we need to compare them necessarily. No, and exactly. If I was involved in an actual organisation like UNIT, I'd probably say, ah, you know what we should do? We should build something just like Avengers Tower, because it works in the movies and we should make it in real life. Oh, exactly. And we mustn't get into debates about who's got the bigger and better tower, I suppose. No. That sort of started off, and then we saw Mel in the tower. That yes! was a return of... They're really coming back, these companions now. They're like... Yeah. We're swimming in them. Mel has always been a favourite of mine, and she has not always been a favourite of fandom. The McCoy era is very much my favourite of the classic eras, and Mel is ridiculous and her character is unlike any human person you would meet particularly in the way that she is scripted and in some ways the way she's performed but we actually got some humanity from Mel this time, and I have always really enjoyed her as a character. And for the first time, she's actually seen using her computer programming capabilities because when she's introduced in the 80s it was announced to all the newspapers this is Mel. She's a computer programmer from Peas Pottage. She never uses a computer in the entire time. Did you see the behind the scenes Doctor Who Unleashed where the actor said, it's the first time I've been in front of a computer for Doctor Who? There is one episode where she is next to a computer and declares it to be a megabyte modem back in 1986, which is obviously a very dangerous thing, a megabyte modem. Who'd have one? But yes, she's actually doing the thing that she's intended to do. And what a delight to see Bonnie Langford, who I've seen live on stage. Her singing is uh, what's the word? It's like fireworks. It's dynamic. It's electrifying. Fireworks aren't electrifying. If yours are, uh, consult a physician. But incredible performance. Goes off with a bang. Uh, when you said, oh, what's the word? I was a bit like, oh, is that going to be a negative word? But no, it's a no, good word. No, no, no. She's incredible. I, I very much like Bonnie Langford. And she seems delightful. Oh, yeah. She seemed pretty cool on the episode as well. Uh, See, so yeah, at least sort of everyone's giggling. And you've got Kate Lethbridge Stewart. Then having the arm um, Z Dex taken off. I was very suspicious of those Z Dexes. I thought they would turn out to secretly be uh, having a malign influence on people. 
but they were not. Ah, you were a bit anti Zdex going with um, Trinity Wells. Trinity Wells. You're a stand for Trinity Wells, are you, Ben? I, I mean, I was very glad to see Trinity Wells back in the show, but I did think, oh dear, I see what she's doing here. And while I'm sure she's normally much calmer in her show. I'm not that sure. I wonder if uh, she'll make another appearance in future series, because it's Russell T Davies. Certainly possible. Talking of the uh, type of personality which um, was trying to be emulated in those anti z things, there was like a, mm-hmm. a section in it where people were freaking out about... Um, Shirley Ann Bingham. As you can see from the emulation, which was shown by uh, Trinity Wells there, Shirley Ann Bingham, she had like a bunch of people on the internet having like a weird go at her for how she uses a wheelchair and then immediately in this episode russell t davies like in this amazing sense of foresight considering this was shot a year before instantly had a bit where it shows those people who are criticizing shirley ann bingham go no you are all idiots you're all horrible people in that one moment and it was like Russell T. Davies is psychic. It does, or he has a, a very good understanding of the human condition, which is unfortunate because the human condition is kind of terrible. Yes, he knows that people go, ah, I've seen that you can walk, I've seen that you can get out of your wheelchair. There are people who love to criticise and condemn. And it's possible, in fact, that we love to criticise and condemn people who love to criticise and condemn because there is always a joy in saying terrible things about people who say terrible things. So I think there's probably some hypocrisy there uh, on my count. But yes, I like that it sort of got into the fact that anyone if you sort of if you take down the things that we do to try and stand against our natural prejudices we probably all have urges and instincts that we know to suppress of churlishness discrimination and paranoia that can bubble up so easily I do. You pull out better than I ever could on that one. I worry um, about it often. Fair play on that one, yeah. So once that bit was done, there was like some funny little sections with 10 Downing Street and the Prime Minister. My favourite line was uh, when it was like, why should I care about you? And then Donna went, no change Erlen. And it, that was just blooming wonderful. I was briefly distracted trying to work out if the politician we saw is meant to be the Prime Minister. Quite possibly. It's not It's not specified one way or the other. He's credited as Edward Lawn Bridges, which it feels like a, a Jacob Rees Mogg or Farage type, or really any of the the current administration. But I think they they could all find some ways to say these things if you only gave them a platform. Yes, yeah, so where were we? Yeah, so Soho, London. That was, and then basically we met the toy maker. We saw Neil Patrick Harris, and my. God, Neil just acted the hell out of that role. Like, unbelievably just was, like, amazing from start till finish all the way through. He is a tremendous joy. He doesn't hold back. He does it with tremendous gusto, but just the right sort of restraint. I do I do suspect, however, this was not the toy maker. This was really Count Olaf in disguise. <laughs> Count Olaf? Have you not seen, um, oh, what's it called? A series of unfortunate events? I don't think I have. It is a tremendous television series. You should certainly look it up. It's on Netflix if you still have access to that. And in it, it is a, an adaptation of a series of children's books. They are tremendously fun. And Neil Patrick Harris plays Count Olaf and in every single story he is disguised as somebody else to try and steal the inheritance from some orphans and the orphans know it's always Count Olaf <laughs> and they're, they're constantly going to ad- adults and saying can't you see this is this is transparently Count Olaf in disguise and the adult goes no it's obviously not because that's not the person that's not the name this person has told us and they can never convince them until he throws off his disguise and tries to do terrible things but it, it feels so suitably adjacent to what he was doing here as the toy maker in an outlandish uh, disguise with clear malign intentions this is not someone anyone would look at and go yeah this is someone friendly this is someone we should trust uh, i've already got the our flag means death on my to watch list which uh, i was like i've heard of this our flag means death and i've uh, watched your trailer i'm like yep that's now my watch list of stuff to check out so so i'll have to add that to the other list to check out a trailer of there are there are so many good things to watch in the world today uh exactly so and then we get some hell of a scenes like once they've met the toy maker and then well to be fair start bit is the corridor we sure have had a lot of corridors recently after last week's very corridor centric episode and i very much liked the i like the rising intensity i like that because doctor who especially in the classic series has a a huge thing for corridors that's huge numbers of scenes of running down corridors and intense things happening in corridors and if there's not enough corridor for people to run they'll just stand urgently and have their intense corridor conversation 
contributions. So I really like that they are still such a major feature of Doctor Who after all these years. And running through a door and getting stuck on both sides, which I guess is the closest we got this week to two people on either sides of a pane of glass. Oh, exactly. I suppose it's not going to be two sides of the same wall in a different parallel universes, is it? <laughs> but there's plenty to compare it to. I particularly liked uh, Donna's adventure with the dolls. You know, let's go to the Donna one first, because that was bloody terrifying. That was the one that got me more than the Doctor section, because it was like, those dolls freaked me out. Yes. Like, I've only had two villains freak me out as a kid in Doctor Who it was the Cybermen because it was like oh they could chop your brains up blah 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 as I was a kid and then it got these things these days I almost had a nightmare but I was like I never had like a scare you know during the Doctor Who series I've seen so far I've never really had a sense of fear from some of the scenes but this one that just you know just creeped me out horrifying I swear. but very well dealt with smashing its head in this is the appropriate response oh exactly i swear i've had nightmares about that sort of thing well now you know what to do yeah smash its head in but then after that you've got the doctor scene where uh, there was this little thing with the guy having his whole body made into a doll as well a puppet that was crazy as well and then after that there was this big cardboardy thing where the toy maker was stood on the front playing with some marionette dolls yes it was a big it was a uh what's it called a puppet a theater puppet theater yes except the strings got cut essentially and it was like well that's all right Liam. it's an excellent line and you render it very you render it very well i feel like this is very authentic yes acknowledgement for um amy and Clara and Bill. And I saw someone saying that Russell T. Davis can get away with calling out Stephen Moffat on his his effectively fridging of all these characters. Oh, but they got a happy ending. Because RTD has seen his own things and sort of, he's seen that what he did so unreasonably with Donna and her ending and has actually come back to make amends. So at this point, he can very validly say, yeah, just call people out on some of the, the very dodgy things that they did. I... I watched The Angels Take Manhattan yesterday. I rewatched it uh, because it's sort of fresh in the memory and because in my household we are watching through the uh, the Matt Smith era and enjoying it very much, although we're into a slightly dodgy season of it. Yes, it, knowing that, that that has been acknowledged by the show and dealt with and not just sort of ignored going forward, all the, the deaths of people who nonetheless lived long, happy lives. Uh, especially when you also see the contrast of Bonnie Langford and Catherine, but in the end I suppose we'll see how... well. Still got the fate of Donna Noble to find out, but that's coming on a bit later on, isn't it? Yes. But then the Doctor has a game, his second game with the toy maker. Yes. And cutting cards. And I was like, oh gosh, that's a bit of a low card. And then, yep, he's lost, but the best of three. And then they went back to the 21st century and then... Back to the future. Back to the future, present, future stuff. Yes. Have, it's not... Have we have we got too many episodes where they've gone back from the past to the future to the past again? No. It's something that has happened radically more since the time of Stephen Moffat. Uh, I think of it coming in very much in things like A Christmas Carol. It's something you see a little bit in the classic series, but not very much. The TARDIS is very rarely used within stories. Uh, but Silver Nemesis, which is a, a favourite McCoy adventure, does have a bit of going in the past to check on some things and to find some things out and then come back with that information, but not change anything. And you see the same in City of Death, also an excellent story. So I guess I like stories that do use the now we'll go to the past, now we'll go back to the present and continue the story with what we've discovered there. Well, in that case, yeah, we've uh, there seems to be plenty of potential for the future. That's what it's always good to have someone who's a bit more of an expert on this than I am. So I can ask these random questions and you just know it and it's brilliant. I have meditated on it day and night since my young youth. And you're probably really happy about the new classics as well coming to BBC IP. Oh, yes. There was also a situation where the Doctor said the reason that the toy maker came through was because the Doctor used salt at the end of the edge of the universe to trick those creatures. And I just remembered a little detail about the fact that why has he always got salt? on him now if he's just got all these endless pockets. I just remembered a thing from the Angel and the Wasp. The unicorn and the Wasp. The unicorn and the Wasp. I remembered the Wasp bit where uh, the yep. Doctor gets poisoned and and it was like, I need salt! There was a good bit about Harvey Warbanger and such. I do like that sequence. It is unfortunate that episode is written by perhaps the biggest turf in Doctor Who fans oh, of Gareth Oh, that guy. Ugh. Yes. 
it, it <laughs> pains me because he wrote some episodes I enjoy very much, but he has extremely strong anti-trans views and is unlikely to be involved with the series again, as I understand it. He is not mild in his thoughts. Yes, yeah, swiftly moving on from dodgy people. So on that front, yes, yeah, so I was thinking, the Doctor now always carries around salt because of that specific thing. And I was like, you've had your theories about non-binary stuff. And I was like, I need my own theory. Where can I get one? And I was like, there's one. This is a good theory. I like it. I can believe this. But yeah, where were we? See, and then they got back to the present, and then we had this amazing dance and song routine from the toy maker. Oh. People on the forums have been unflatteringly comparing it with the uh, Rasputin thing from The Power of the Doctor. Le- why can't they both have a nice dance? Yeah, exactly. And I do think I preferred this one very much because in the Rasputin one, it was all. It's the master. The master's dressed as Rasputin. Whereas this one, it is the toy maker is being ridiculous, but also being terrifying. And people are dying and the story is advancing. And we're seeing characters we like in actual threat. So I felt this really used the the format. And also, what a great song. What a banger. Oh, definitely. I've heard to be fair, the master had one, I think, in, didn't he? I think people kept mentioning The that. Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Lords. He, uh, he dances to um, I Can't Decide by the Scissor Sisters. But he only listens to the second half of the song, which one is convenient for the duration, and two takes out the word fuck, which appears in the first half of that song. Gotta keep it kid friendly. Yes. Yeah, that was blooming amazing what Neil Patrick Harris did. Because he's been doing juggling, dancing, marionette doll doing puppetry. Puppetry. That's a good way of putting it. He's so talented. Exactly. I'm struggling to pick between either Neil Patrick Harris's The Toy Maker or La Meep as my favourite villains of this uh, free parter. Why choose? We enjoy them both uh, equally. It's it's that thing. What a pair of villains. It's interesting that the the middle episode not having such an over. I mean, it had overt villains, but it it had a threat that was not so much a flamboyant villain, and so it gave us a very different sort of threat and a very different sort of scare. I think these have been a, a rich set of Doctor Who adventures. Well, the scale just kept going up and up on each episode. I suppose after the dance sequence, we then got the bit with the game, where the toy maker went, I've had a game with the first Doctor, then I played it with this Doctor, now to play the game with the next Doctor. What a thing to say, and what a concept. I, I did not anticipate this, and when he said it, I thought, can you do this? Can you have a regeneration pathway through a story? Because I'm so... I did think we're probably going to have a good watch of uh, Shooty Gatwa in this episode for two reasons. Firstly, we knew he was going to say what the hell is going on in this episode, and I was sure that wasn't going to be the only thing he was going to say, because that's a terrible first line. And also, they, the BBC had sort of trailed the regeneration. They trailed the fact there was going to be a regeneration. Oh, that I thought, was so much. Why would they clue us in on this? if this is really what's going to happen. I feel like this is going to be a bait and switch. Yeah, I messaged you just before the episode aired thinking, I'm seeing a lot of regeneration uh, advertising going on by the Doctor Who team. Now, is there there's some, must be something going on with this. And I responded, how dare you talk to me about Doctor Who and try to keep away from spoilers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very rudely. <laughs> well, not rudely. I was like, yeah, fair enough. I, I'd probably, f- I, w- I would be the same. So I was like, fair enough on my part, fair enough on your part on that one. I, I was out that evening at Queer Mageddon, which is a magnificent Magnificent Sheffield-based queer comedy and cabaret night. Lots of trans performers. A magnificent blind non-binary drag king who uh, did a remarkable strip. And because I was out of that, I wasn't going to be seeing the episode, which is why I was so insistent on not hearing any spoilers. I thought, I'm not going to look at my phone whatever. I'm going to go to this show. It's going to be amazing. And I'm going to spend the whole time thinking, I was watching Doctor Who. But it was a great show. And then I'm going to go straight home and watch Doctor Who and then watch it again. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Sorry, yes, you were saying about the uh, about trailing the regeneration before I interrupted. I was like, there must be something going on with that, and I was like, because it was like, you wouldn't be over, overly advertising, because what if the kids look at the thing and catch on or something? But as you said, we were thinking, there must be like some kind of bait and switch, or as I, I just got a bit of suspicion. I, no, no, I did say it, they said, they seem to be teasing a regeneration a lot on socials. What if they're providing a misdirection? Mm-hmm. Why spoil the show if not to surprise us. And then BAM! I was right. Past me was correct. And I am happy. You're on the ball with these things. Which is good because that was the game they played. It was the ball. The ball. So basically Shooty Gatwa and what a guy. David Tennant, they bi-generated. What are your thoughts on the bi-generation? What a thing to do. 
What an incredible thing. What an audacious thing to do. And as you, as you suggested earlier, this does sort of follow up my banging on in the last two episodes about, I think there's a binary slash non-binary thing going on. I, they, they talked about so much how two things which are contradictory can be true at the same time. They'd done the whole binary, non-binary thing with the Metacrisis Doctor and with Rose. And I thought, I'm sure the third part is going to have something really significant about the binary and sort of breaking uh, the binary or transcending it and not being, it has to be this or this. It can be a a third both or neither or something beyond and then this was in fact not what I expected because I'd been working up my theory in a forum post that got very little traction although someone did say yes you were right afterwards which is always it's nice to be vindicated but I my theory was that the big thing that would happen here is the doctor is given an impossible choice between two things and he was going to choose a thing which is neither option and go to unite things and we'd see that the alternative to the binary is unity and suddenly it clicked in my mind what Chibnall was doing by creating the division because I thought if you're looking, thinking in very black and white terms of the binary then you're thinking in terms of division and what's the opposite of a division it's a unit and division now I realise is obviously created as the opposite to unit it is the uh, the shadowy sinister malign organisation the Doctor was part of in the before times before the uh, the much more wholesome unit of the modern day. And I thought, yes, it's going to be about unit, it's going to be about uniting, it's going to be about unity. I was absolutely wrong about this part of it, because it was the Doctor dividing. He was cleft in twain! Oh, that is a great way to put it, cleft in twain. And he said I love it would words. take a bit of courage to do the by generation. I saw so many balls, and I was thinking, it'll take a lot of balls to do this, mm-hmm. and they brung a lot of balls to the game as well. I'm wondering about the by generation I think it's a cool concept, but I've got a bit, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, like, uh, how things will work. Like, if, what happens when well, David Tennant's 14th Doctor kicks the bucket, essentially, or pops his clogs? Do, does it, does, when he regenerates, does he then regenerate into 15 again but then if he does regenerate into 15 then at a random point in time as the doctors finished whatever he was doing he then plops out of david tennant again i don't know my housemate ava has a uh, a theory that that it must be involved at some point david tennant's doctor going back and re-entering the time stream somehow to then regenerate into uh shooty gatwa in fact i'm going to try and find there was a line here which uh, she was using as uh, the the cornerstone of that shooty gatwa's doctor said i'm fine because you fixed yourself we're time lords we're doing a rehab out of order and she thinks the idea of doing rehab out of order suggests that Shuti Gatwa's doctor is so self-assured and relieved of that burden because he comes after what is now going to happen with David Tennant having that, that chance to relax and unwind and decompress. I'm not so sure. I think she may well be right on this. But my theory is it's not that David Tennant becomes the doctor again and goes back and becomes Shuti Gatwa at the end of his natural living out life which I like to think he'll live forever, but that it is the mere fact that that is going to happen meant that Shuji Gatwa was, was relieved of that burden. And I, I saw it a bit, this may be a bit tenuous, but I saw it a bit as, could you view transition as like this? That in some way, if we're looking at the, the slightly peculiar way of transition being described, or I suppose being the Doctor and the Metacrisis being described in The Star Beast, of your you're, you contain both and neither and more. That in some ways this is like a transition where it's not you have your new self and your old self, your dead name, is dead to you, which would be the traditional way of looking at regeneration. But you sort of split into two. You have your new self, who you are now, but it doesn't mean you've killed your pre-transition self. They are still alive in some way and you no longer have to carry their burden and their trauma of that. That they sort of, they they are at rest rather than being slain and never to be spoken of again. Exactly. Doctor Who should always be a good trans allegory. Oh, yes. So I sort of came up with the spot just now. But I was thinking, what if just when the 14 regenerates, it just teleports, just space time just randomly teleports the 14th, who's now regenerated into the 15th, back into the hip of 14th at the point of him by generating or something. It's possible. In Logopolis, which is Tom Baker's final story, there is a shadowy uh, figure who is seen called the Watcher, who the Doctor goes and talks to a couple of times during the story, just in the distance, but we never see those conversations. And it's sort of, it's uncertain who that is. And at the end, the Watcher appears and merges into the Doctor's body. And I think it's Nissa says it was the Doctor all the time. And it has sort of been a sort of future projection of the Doctor that comes and merges and helps with the regeneration 
generation. And I kind of like the idea that maybe David Tennant goes back in time and is the Watcher and folds back into himself between the fourth and fifth Doctors, and that he is the Watcher. I have no, uh, I have no strong basis for this, but it, it is the closest thing I can think of to a merging of two and one or a separating of one and two in regeneration stories. I think I saw some random things on the internet about what if the 14 just re- revisits a few of his old selves and then becomes the director. The curator. The curator. The great curator. You know... I rather think he might. Maybe they don't explain it and they have some kind of good mystery that then gives people thinking and imagining. I sort of don't want to come around to any uh, decision on this because I think a lot of fans are trying to lay down hard lines or argue hard lines of it's definitely this or it's definitely that. But I like how open it is mm. and we don't need to know the the definites of this. In the InVision commentary, which you can see on iPlayer, uh, Russell T. Davis espouses the view that actually the bi-generation affected every Doctor and so every previous Doctor is now alive out there having regenerated, uh, having bi-generated like that. And I don't know if that will be followed up at all, but I love the concept. And it could explain where the curator came from, among other things. I suppose also another part of it is, Russell T. Davis was very open to the idea of having old Doctors maybe come back for, like, maybe spin-off series or something. That'd be... Mm -hmm. I would be up for a good Seventh Doctor A spin-off series or something. Oh, yes. I think think I've messaged about this previously. And some of the old tales of the Tardises did leave some things up for uh, possibilities in like the hey let's go off an adventure in a memory Tardis at the end of the seventh and Ace is one I n- I remembered seeing yes this this by generation actually casts the memory Tardis into a whole new light maybe those aren't just memories of the Doctor projected maybe those are the by generated uh, Doctors. One other thing about the regeneration. Are you aware of how they devised regeneration originally in the 60s? Mate, let's see what you say, because we'll probably need to explain to the audience, so I'll be a surrogate. They were having difficulty with William Hartnell, who was getting very ill with arteriosclerosis and memory loss and things, and John Wiles, the producer at the time, who I really like as a producer, I like his very small era, he only did about three stories, had a plan to replace the Doctor. And so what he did was he got Brian Hales, I think, to write a story called The Celestial Toymaker. And the idea was the Doctor would be made invisible at the start of it and is invisible throughout the middle episodes. You can only see the Doctor's hand. And when he became visible again, he would be played by a different actor. And this would be a thing that has been done by the power of the Toymaker. And the BBC top people said, no, you can't do that. You can't write out the main character like that. They did then write out the main character in a very similar way with introducing regeneration about six stories down the line from there. But the original concept was that this weird process, the way to recast the actor was to do something with a a supernatural, godly type figure, the Celestial Time Maker, who has finally come back and actually had something to do with an audacious regeneration. So finally, the Time Maker's original purpose has been fulfilled in some way. Oh, that's actually fascinating, yeah, because it's like, oh look, the Time Maker has finally regenerated a doctor in that way. That is actually quite fascinating. I didn't know that. And blimey, yeah. Yeah, because I did hear about the invisible doctor thing, but I didn't know about the fact that it was then going to be used to regenerate the doctor into a new one. Because I remember seeing the old Adventures in Time and Space sweet drama documentary thingy. But of course, a new doctor steps into the fold. And as David Tennant is uh, now taking a step back from playing the doctor, we now see a new doctor step into the fray. Yeah. Yes, and shooty. shooty, and what did you think of the first scenes of him? He's incredible. He's delightful. He's powerful. He's so he's so charismatic. He has buckets of riz, as they say these days. And I really liked, um, I really liked everything about what he did there. I, this is not the thing we've ever seen with a doctor before, just coming in immediately, having a multi doctor story. Uh, I did think within, with about, in about a minute of him coming, I thought, wow, I'm seeing a multi doctor story I wasn't expecting between two of my very favorite doctors, because he is immediately up there in, among my favorites. And I'm trying to think, there's a, a site that has lots of transcripts of this, checkatea.net, which has transcripts of all of Doctor Who, which is very useful for checking out. And um, the first thing he says is no way. That's his first line, which has come up a time earlier in this uh, this episode. No way is what the doctor says when he sees Mel. No way. This is the best news. And in fact, both times, no way comes up in this episode. It is the best news. It is seeing someone incredible and wonderful. And then he says, no, I'm me. 
I think I'm really, really me. Oh, 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 I am completely me. And that really felt like what Rose said after being filled with the the power of the Doctor in um, the Star Beast a couple of weeks ago, or I guess earlier in the day from the Doctor's point of view. They both go through this incredible regeneration process, but it is not like a regeneration as we know it. It is very not binary, <laughs> and then come out of it feeling more themselves than ever. And I feel like that is a wonderful thing. I am I am completely me. Uh, I'm really, really me. It's an incredible thing for a doctor to say after, uh, I mean, as their first line. Because, of course, that's always the case. Exactly, because there's always the thing where, like, who am I? At the, yes. Uh, some arc of something. So I, I love this. And I love that they divided the clothes between them. Shooting out, we're just walking in in boxes. That's, mm-hmm. we should normalise just walking around in boxes. It just makes life easier. Just have to get changed. Go on, then. <laughs> not not in December, thank you very much. To drill on that one, you seem to be very keen. You said favourite Doctor for only a few minutes of it. Yeah, yeah. I am so excited for the Shooter Getwa era. I I don't know. He just has an incredible way of talking. I like the way he says TARDIS. Natural voice. And I I like his his style, his array of outfits, just the, the confidence and charisma and vibes. And I really like, from what his Doctor does in this episode how he really cares for and is very supportive mm. of the 14th Doctor. He uh, he treats him very tenderly in some ways as a, a real close friend and tells him very clearly that, that basically tells him you need, ther- <laughs> uh, you need therapy, you need to relax, you need, you need a chair, you need to sit there. down. Not, a, not putting him down <laughs> at all. Yeah, but... But this is an excellent, to the extent that the Doctor is masculine, this is a wonderful masculinity to see. Just being very plain and straight with friends about looking after themselves. And he just seems like a cool guy also. I I do like him. I really do like him. I'm sort of, I feel like I need to see a whole episode before making a judgment. Cause I'm still, um, he is really good. His vibes are brilliant. Mm -hmm. I'm just, um, I always prefer to see the doctor whole episode to himself. Well, you're in luck. Oh yes. Another one coming in two weeks. Vibes on the, on shooty. Brilliant. I love him. He's definitely higher than, I've got to say, from the doctors I've seen, Nine's sort of near the... It sounds a bit sacrilegious, but he's not my favourite doctor. They can't all be your favourite. No, exactly. But uh, Shooty's definitely climbing the ranks very highly. Christmas is coming, and it sounds like we're going to be having some an extra episode of Hoover Chance. Yes! If, if for those who want more, do comment and let us know uh, on whatever platform you're commenting on. We are very keen that there be some special things like this for patrons, which will then appear in front of the real world at some point in the future but I'm kind of glad that we don't do this every week every week oh exactly because <laughs> I, I would melt you already have to edit one podcast already uh, I mean I, I finished editing the latest What the Yesterday. Trans a couple of days ago and then a week ago the Who the Trans and a couple of days before that there was another What the Trans because they're coming thick and fast Crazy. so I may take a couple of days on this one because I feel like uh, four episodes in two weeks too, slightly too many. Fair play on that one, really. Totally understandable. Yes, we will certainly be back with an episode of this at Christmas, whether you like it or not. Yes, it's a warning, everyone. We will, whether you like it or not. I mean, I think I've recorded like a podcast, two podcasts a week at this point. It's crazy. I, I can assure you, you have. Oh, I have more behind the scenes stuff for that flu patrons, I suppose, there. But yeah, I suppose after that, the shooty regenerated and then they had the ball throwing game i think there was at one point you know when the toy maker misses the ball in his hand mm-hmm. it falls off the edge of a thing for a moment now, i thought that the toy maker was just going to jump off the roof and try and catch it in some kind of mystical way to go say ha i have the ball but nope Missed it, and then uh, tied up very nicely, and then we get to see the TARDISes. Actually, no, before we do that, what did you think of the ending of the Toy Maker? Because I think uh, some people had some criticisms. Of... I thought it was excellent. I thought his promise of his legions coming is uh, fascinating, and I do like the idea that maybe things are open to more supernatural threats from here on. At the end of the Toy Maker, some people were disappointed that it was such a simple game, but I liked that they did go with something so simple. They could have gone with something fancy, but the fancy 
reality thing right now is it's David Tennant and Shuji Gatwa against the Toy Maker, and I think it didn't need to be any more complex than it was. And I loved the way he folded up and went in a box because that's what you do with toys. Yeah, it's a pretty good way to uh, end it off. And plus, it was foreshadowed throughout the whole episode. The balls. What a load of them. Yes, exactly. So later on in the episode, where uh, you've got two Tardises. Oh, one Tardis twice. One Tardis twice. Depending on how you look at it. That's true. Yes. I loved that it was done by hitting it with a giant mallet. That's the only way you can do it. I wouldn't have accepted a scientific <laughs> way of, oh, I've worked out how to do this. But hitting it with a mallet while the, the magical powers of the toy maker are still filling the place. Yeah, yeah. go for it. And it's wheelchair accessible oh, now. Yes. The steepness of the ramps is a little steep, so it's not actually up to British building standards, but it is still fairly accessible. Well, yeah, it was. I was thinking it was a slope, but like, I see what you mean by not up to building standards, but I'm, I'm very happy there was still some kind of wheelchair accessibility. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not condemning it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, it would be nice if it had a, a a pause to rest every after every 10 meters of upward slope but I suppose there are two TARDISes now and I very much like how at the end we get the suggestion that Rose has been off to Mars and various members of the family have been off on various adventures and I think long may they continue we may not hear about them we may not see them if we do we are very fortunate but I am delighted with the current way that it is and also you've got the Wilf on the in the corner they, they were like we, all, we can't have Wilf pass away have him have Wilf on the other side of a wall or in the corner Shooting, shooting moles. moles with fo- with the moles Shooty. in the force fields. But yeah, exactly. So he has been to Mars and apparently Russell T. Davis is saying that... Rose has been to Mars. Yes. I say this purely because there was a different Yaz who the Doctor knew very well oh, less yes, than so, a day yes. ago in his own lifetime. But yes. Yes, so Yasmin Finney may make another appearance, apparently. I will be very happy. It's always great to have trans characters reoccur. Because I think I heard it from Who Coach who said Russell T. Davies said mm-hmm. it on something they're pretty reliable this would not surprise me i think i think that is the case we will see rose noble again and hopefully i i hope we will see more of the family as well i i wasn't wasn't sure what to make of the fact that uh of course out of all the people who is uh vegan at the table it is established clearly that it is rose the one trans person i don't know how often those things go together maybe it's just a, a matter of youth i don't know if we've had it have we had anyone else vegan in doctor who that's true i say this as a tedious omnivore yeah i i'm 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 omnivorous as well, so uh, when it comes to vegan representation, we're probably not the best people to go to on that front. I'm really hoping we can see more of Yaz Finney in the future, or Rose. I'm sure she'll be much in demand. I feel like her star is in the ascendant, and these episodes will only have done more for her public uh, knowledge of her, so I think we will see her in many things, but as much Doctor Who as we get from her, I'll be very glad. Oh, definitely. And then pretty much uh, the episode ends and uh, yeah what do you think of the ending of that one it was happy it was the only time we've ever had a happy ending for a doctor it made me realize every doctor ends in tragedy it may be a sort of bittersweet tragedy but it always ends with my favourite characters perishing never to be seen again or only in in cameos partway through their lives but it was a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's true. It is a peaceful end for a Doctor. It has been pointed out that, as I say, a, m- a mere day since the end of Power of the Doctor, where the Doctor tells Yaz, uh, tells actual Yaz, her companion Yaz, uh, I can't settle down with you, it's not something I can do, and so you need to, basically, you need to get out of the TARDIS, because there's no way I can settle down and start a family. Get out of the program, Yaz. Uh, uh, yeah. A day later, the Doctor is doing exactly what was promised, couldn't be done, uh, but with Donna, and presumably just a few miles up the road from uh, from Yaz. But maybe David Tennant's Doctor will go along to some of those companion meetings we saw at the end of the Power Ooh. of the Doctor and say, oh, Oh, by the way, (laughs) I'm I'm on Earth now. Let's hang out. If he doesn't, it's rude, because Mel Mel goes to both that and the Doctor's dinners, so she knows whether he's going or not. Exactly, the Doctor can go to the companion meetings. I didn't even realise. That's going to be so cool. I'm going to shake my desk if I bounce around too much. It's fun to shake your desk. (laughs) It's more the parents downstairs eating their dinners or something, you know, and uh, they're like, what's all that creaking sounds going along just tell them you're excited about Doctor Who yes and yeah because like you saw the whole seating arrangements and like yeah it was a Doctor's companion seeing the Doctor again in a 21st century Martha uh, 
No, not her. She's in the parallel universe. She sure is. Well, she's got a doctor. Yeah, she's got a doctor. Uh, she's great. Uh, her and Donna did pretty well by each getting a spare David Tennant. <laughs> Ma- Martha is the one who's been left out of this arrangement. Oh, exactly. Oh. No Doctor Who for you. But yeah, I suppose, uh, yeah, very happy ending on that one. But yeah, I think that concludes the trilogy of episodes, which then makes us think, what a trilogy. What a trilogy. It was astonishing. It was delightful. I, I have overwhelmingly been positive about it because they made me so happy. Maybe at some point I will look back and I'll go, hmm, this is peculiar. And especially looking back on the, I know it follows the theme, but the slightly weird non-binary slash trans stuff of sort of conflating those terms in uh, the first of the episodes. But in general, I have enjoyed this very Doctor who Doctor Who, and this whole month of Doctor Who. Um, it has been exactly what I need in this dark time of the year. Oh, exactly. It's been a wonderful series of free. I mean, you could eat, watch each one on their own and still enjoy them as singular episodes episodes as well which is something i really liked as well because a lot of what my whenever my family have been watching the moffat era or the chibnall era they're always like gosh like that you can't have singular episodes that are easy to follow along is one of their often complaints and such but these ones have to me sound like they've pretty much fulfilled those ones because they're all great on their own but as a unit together they're still cohesive and brilliant as a narrative yeah they stand alone while also being so closely joined it's just it's wonderfully both of those things wild blue yonder i was like i was more like star beast i sort of had a little bit of a dip with wild blue yonder but it was still a great thing it was mainly shaky cgi but aside from that it was bloody brilliant but then the last one and the first one really good and none of them really drag each other down but they're all brilliant really looking forward to seeing what happens next at the church on ruby road yes wild blue yonder is the one that, that stands out as most different to the other two in some ways i like it a lot I love it less, not because it is worse or because it has any failings, but purely because I love the others more, because of the things they do with their guest characters, which cannot be done in the middle one. So I think these are all, these are all a very high bar of Doctor Who. Maybe it's because we've had slightly more difficult years of Doctor Who recently oh, exactly. that makes these so stand out as particularly <laughs> gleaming. What a time to be alive. Now for the next series, I have only one prediction, and I'm not going to predict anything too spoilery, but I really hope the Kaiser Chiefs have a moment where they do the song Ruby 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 ah, 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 ah. as like a random just insert at one point because one of the characters name is Ruby yes I would also accept Ruby Tuesday but uh, <laughs> I would be glad of either of these songs <laughs> oh, maybe like because you saw there was like a, a scene where there's a disco in the trailer mm-hmm. for those who okay spoilers for the trailers everyone Bong. spoilers for the trailer Bong. yeah because during one of the because um, it was like a little club that they were in maybe they just have a moment where just as part of just musical just convenience for the plot the song ruby root you know ruby by uh kaiser chiefs just randomly appears we shall see indeed uh murray gold has a lovely theme for her as well i'm very curious to hear that in the next series and that's it yes. for who the trans for this special special but we'll be back at christmas tide so you don't forget to hang up your sock, because we'll be coming down the chimney down. Pouring our voices into your ears as a lovely Chris- post-Christmas present. Sounds alarming, yes. but you've got to do something in that, that strange week between Christmas and New Year, and we are that something. Oh, exactly. Although we will also be appearing next week on What the Trans. I won't. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, well, Ben will be very lovingly editing for What the Trans. I could I could do it with hatred in my heart, but I shall Oh, hopefully not. That'd be awkward. You know, there's always a space open if you ever felt like doing a random What the Trans episode one day. It would require me to know what the news is, which I don't until I listen to the episode. <laughs> So you listen to it in the edit. That's how Ben gets the uh, bi-weekly news fix. Yes, that's who the trans. That's who for new. Who knew for trans. Let's end it on that. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. Trans and non-binary. Who the trans, 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 trans.